Well, it's great to finally be up here after listening to a lot of you give wonderful talks over the past couple of days. I've really enjoyed this and learned a lot. Um, so I want to start by saying, okay, payment for ecosystem service markets, what we're talking about um, in Wyoming, in southwestern Wyoming, is basically um, a situation in which energy companies need off-site mitigation to compensate for the uh, disturbance that they're creating on the landscape. So they pay landowners to implement best management practices on their land, and those landowners then result, uh, excuse me, those practices then result in um, improvements in ecosystem services. So in a nutshell, that's what we're talking about, and I'll provide some more details as we go along. So this is also a case study uh, rather than a polished curriculum. Um, and in, even more than that, it's a case study that is still in progress. Roger and I and others on the project have been involved in setting up this market for about two years, and we still have a long ways to go. So uh, maybe we'll be back in a few years with <laughs> some ideas about do's and don'ts. We'll see how it goes. So, um, I guess I'll start out by defining some of the words on my title slide. Um, so ecosystem services, these are the benefits that people derive from ecosystems, including the conventional commodities that we always think about, like food and water, but also regulating services, like flood regulation and water purification, and also cultural services, like uh, spiritual and recreational resources. So when we talk about payment for ecosystem services, we're talking about um, a market-based approach to providing financial incentives uh, or compensation to private landowners for engaging in environmentally beneficial practices that might not otherwise be continued uh, or undertaken in the first place, okay? So that's what I just said. Um, so here's an example of uh, ecosystem service provision from southwestern Wyoming, the region where we're working. Uh, this is, uh, you know, just south of Yellowstone in the gr upper Green River Basin. This is um, uh, part of the headwaters of the Colorado River Basin. Um, it's absolutely stunningly beautiful up there. And what we're looking at right now is an artificial wetlands um, that is basically, um, um, this is at the tail end of an irrigation district. And this wetland exists because the irrigation district exists. So agriculture in the Green River Basin is primarily um, beef cattle production. And so the agricultural producers on this irrigation district use their water to uh, flood irrigate their fields to grow some alfalfa hay, but mostly native grasses, that's pretty much all that grows there, <laughs> um, to feed their cattle over the winter. Okay. So this is low value agriculture. Um, they don't like it when I say that, but low value agriculture, I mean, um, you know, compared to the fruit and nut tree crops that we see in California, um, there's not a whole lot of direct agricultural value to what's going on here. Um, but there are these additional ecosystem service values, uh, environmental and recreational values, and so we, um, as economists, as extension educators, need to be talking to agricultural producers about these um, non-market values that they provide to society um, when they engage in agriculture. So I'll give you uh, a couple of examples of successful payment for ecosystem service markets that exist elsewhere in the country, and the first is probably the most successful, uh, most well-known example. Um, the Catskills watershed uh, in New York, upstate New York, is a major source of drinking water for New York City. Um, so a few years back, New York City uh, was faced with the prospect of spending $6 billion to build a water treatment plant uh, to improve water quality for drinking. Um, the alternative that they uh, figured out was to pay just $1.5 billion to farmers uh, in the Catskills watershed to um, improve their agricultural practices and thereby improving water quality so that they could avoid having to pay for that water treatment plant. So another less, well, less well-known example um, is from Fort Hood, Texas. This is a pilot project that happened a few years ago. Um, let's see, the Department of Defense, this is where we are. The Department of Defense was um, destroying golden-cheeked warbler habitat with their training exercises. Um, stopping the training exercises was not a, a viable alternative. And so what they did instead is they went in search of off-site mitigation. They found landowners um, in the range of the warbler habitat to implement 
um, best management practices to improve warbler habitat on their own land. Um, the Department of Defense got credit, the landowners got money, and um, it was a fairly successful project. And so this is um, one of our um, um, one of our examples that um, we're hoping to um, imitate in southwestern Wyoming. So I'd like to talk about uh, two more things. Um, I'm going to switch the order a little bit here. I'm going to start by talking about concretely what we're doing in the uh, Upper Green River with our conservation exchange. And then I'll come back and talk about maybe how we're doing. What are some of the key components that these markets need to have? And uh, where are we with those? And um, while I'm here, um, I'll point out that on your thumb drive um, is a primer that um, actually, if you open up your thumb drive right now and look at that um, primer, then basically that's the world premiere. <laughs> because <laughs> I submitted the document um, to, um, um, to uh, Betsy about a month ago, um, even before it was out, and now delayed publication means that uh, basically this is the first premiere of this document. But this is all about um, primer, or excuse me, um, wildlife habitat exchanges, um, specifically in Wyoming, but then also elsewhere in the western United States. So um, I'll move on now. This is basically what we're trying to set up here. So we've got some uh, landowners who are the supply, and they're selling, they're generating credits by doing good stuff on their land and selling those credits to the conservation exchange. And in exchange for doing that, they get money. And then on the demand side of the market, we have entities who um, are either energy companies who um, need mitigation so that they can drill more holes in the ground, or they are local and national um, NGOs who have some other interest in um, um, investing in conservation. Um, so they uh, go to the conservation exchange and uh, buy credits. And um, uh, with good monitoring and third-party verification, then this market transaction results in some improvement in ecosystem service. I'll skip this. The devil's in the details. We'll get there. <laughs> so Upper Green River Basin, here we are in southwestern Wyoming. Um, there's a lot of energy development here um, in the past 15, 20 years. Um, hydraulic frac fracturing, for example. Um, and uh, it's also um, a, a wonderful place environmentally. It's, as I mentioned, the, headwater the headwaters of the Colorado River system. Um, it's uh, the longest migratory route for mule deer in the country, and uh, uh, it's a flyway for lots of migratory birds as well. Um, and on top of all of that, you have the agricultural community that has been there for about 100 years, and so all of these different groups, um, there are tensions there now. And, uh, and these tensions, actually, I'll say, actually a lot like the last presentation, um, the, the roots of the conservation exchange um, really is conversations between landowners um, back in 2007. Um, how, can we, how can we get an additional stream of revenue um, from all of these ecosystem services that we provide um, to the public um, and that this additional stream of revenue can help us uh, maintain our ranch operations? Um, and so the Sublette County Conservation District has been involved in these discussions from the start at the behest of the landowners. And I'll talk about the other project partners in a minute, but I'll just say that uh, um, right now we are focused on three ecosystem services. The first is uh, riparian habitat and function along the lines of the picture that I showed you a few minutes ago, and also mule deer habitat, and also greater sage-grouse habitat. Um, I, before I moved to Wyoming four years ago, I did not know what a greater sage-grouse was, um, and that's all I hear about now. <laughs> Um, it's a candidate species under the Endangered Species Act, and um, um, uh, in 2015, the Fish and Wildlife Service will make a decision about whether to list it as threatened or endangered. So there's a lot of attention on the ground on this species and ways to improve its habitat to avoid, if possible, a listing. All right, so two years ago, um, the University of Wyoming, um, mostly Extension folks, the Sublette County Conservation District and the Nature Conservancy got together and um, submitted a conservation innovation grant uh, to, um, to, well, scope the feasibility of developing a payment for ecosystem services market in the Upper Green River Basin. And so that grant was successful and has resulted in a lot of interviews and focus groups and conversations with 
potential buyers and sellers and regulators um, in the upper Green River Basin, what would this market look like? And in fact, those conversations um, attracted the attention of the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, which is interested in setting up habitat exchanges across the western United States to um, improve habitat sufficiently that uh, candidate species like the greater sage grouse um, do not need to be listed. Okay. So um, since the Environmental Defense Fund got involved about a year ago, we've had an infusion of uh, financial and technical support, um, which has been quite useful for us. Okay. So um, I'll just uh, point out a couple of things we've learned um, from sellers. Um, sellers like the two-sided market idea that uh, the funding doesn't come from the federal government. They like uh, term leases as opposed to perpetual easements because they like to maintain their possibility of uh, changing uh, business in the future. Uh, they like program administration to be as local as possible, an uh, upfront payment. Um, and they also like the idea that they can get paid for continuing to do good things rather than um, having to um, improve. Um, and, uh, you know, th this is a, a complex issue, um, one of the many um, associated with this project. So the willing buyers, if we heard from focus group participants that um, regulatory assurances are key. The energy companies want to know that if they undertake conservation now, it will count later on if uh, the species is listed. Um, but uh, they also want a uh, good bang for the buck. They want to know that the conservation exchange is based on good science. And this is because um, part of the reason that they participate is for PR, for their company, but it's also because they're good people and we all want our money to go to good things, right? not be wasted. Um, so in uh, the Upper Green River, um, there's definitely an ecological motivation. This is an ecosystem at risk because of all these pressures that I mentioned already, um, which uh, I think is a necessary ingredient for um, a market like this. Um, so we have voluntary participation by buyers and sellers, uh, term lease focus, and um, I'll mention that, uh, right, so what we've done so far is focus groups and interviews, and we've started the process of um, putting together some pilot transactions, one-on-one -on -one transactions, that will help us to explore some of the um, trickier issues associated with this market. Um, one of them is, I mean, 50% of the land in um, in the Upper Green River Basin is federal, and so the Bureau of Land Management is very much involved, and that brings into the equation a host of, a host of um, land management issues and regulatory issues that uh, would be easier not to have to deal with. Um, um, and so we are working with three landowners in particular right now uh, to develop proposals uh, for, uh, you know, what a transaction would look like on their land, and what could they provide, what could they do in terms of practices that would result in improvements to the ecosystem. And we are taking those to, um, well, the regulatory agencies, BLM primarily. Um, and uh, so basically, this mock transaction activity is going to result in a workshop in March where um, all of the regulators are and, and buyers and sellers, anybody who has an interest in this market is going to sit down for a day or two in Pinedale um, and work through what a transaction is going to look like. And we've actually had a lot of interest um, from the state as well in um, how we might scale up what we're doing in the Green River Basin to the state level, um, specifically for the greater sage grouse, um, because the entire state is worried about the possibility of a listing. Um, but then also, um, you know, policy makers see um, other ecosystem services and other uh, candidate species on down the line who might be in need of some sort of additional conservation effort like this. Okay. So the folks from the state from Cheyenne will also be um, at this mock transaction workshop in March. Um, okay, I'm going to circle back now and uh, look at a few slides that I skipped. Um, all right, here we go. Key components of uh, payment for ecosystem service markets. Um, so willing sellers and buyers is pretty important and also an ecosystem service at risk and these are kind of um, these are necessary conditions, right? You cannot go forward and set up a market like this unless you have these three pieces in place. And then there are three more components that we think are also pretty important. We haven't quite gotten there yet with the Green River Basin uh, Conservation Exchange, but um, it must be the case that we can find a price that buyer and seller can agree on. And that includes the, um, um, how we deal with the risk associated with non-attainment. What if a landowner implements a practice and the desired ecosystem service does not occur. Who bears that risk? Is it the landowner who doesn't get paid? 
or is it the buyer who has to go out and buy another credit, or is it society as a whole um, who, who, who just, you know, just suffers because the ecosystem service is not provided? And that third is what usually what happens now. And so um, we're working to structure the market to make that not be an issue. Um, I'll just make one more point. I, I'm, let's see, I'll make <laughs> two more points. The first is that, um, you know, if this is the market that I described earlier, basically because we're dealing with so much public land, um, this is really what the market looks like. And it's uh, really quite complicated. I would direct you to the primer for more information on what this all looks like. Or um, please contact uh, Roger or me about this. And I guess the last thing I will say is that um, I think it's really great that Extension is working on this project. There are a lot of people involved in this project, stakeholders, and everybody has a motivation for being at the table. And it, I think it's really good for the project that the motivation of some people at the table, the Extension people, um, is uh, research-based education and um, making sure that what happens is good for the region and good for the state. I think that's healthy. So, yeah. Thank you.